Here's where we left off. We were talking about Frank Starling, and there are two more examples of Frank Starling that I wanted to talk to you about, right? First, we started out with this baby who had the stomach flu, and now you know that if someone asks you, why are we giving this patient IV fluids, the answer very well might be Frank Starling, as it is in this situation. But let's look at another application of Frank Starling. Here's another patient. Uh, in this case, your patient's a 30-year-old man, and he underwent abdominal surgery after a back car accident. Sorry, <laughs> typo. It's supposed to say a bad car accident, bad car accident. Anyway, so he had surgery, and ever since he's been under your care, he has been unconscious, and he's unconscious because he's on pain meds and, well, he went through a bad car accident. So over the six hours that you've been watching him, his heart rate has gone from 60 beats per minute up to 90 beats per minute. An increase in heart rate can be a sign that a patient is having pain, but this patient remains asleep and is not demonstrating any signs of pain. So what is happening in this situation? Again, the explanation could be Frank Starling. So let's go over this man's statistics. Immediately after surgery, his end diastolic volume was 150 ml, so that was healthy. And at that time, his ejection fraction was 60%. Again, that's healthy. What was his stroke volume? I'd like you to pause the video for a moment and calculate his stroke volume. If his end diastolic volume is 150 ml and his, end, and his ejection fraction is 60%. Pause it. When we pick up, it is 90 mLs. His stroke volume is 90 mLs per beat. And at that time, his heart rate was 60 beats per minute. We said that in, uh, in this explanation. So if you know his heart rate was 60 beats per minute, I want you to calculate his cardiac output. Go ahead, you can do it. Pause the video, grab your calculator. It was 5,400 mLs per minute. Great. Now. He still needs 5,400 mLs per minute. While he's been laying there in the bed, his uh, demand for blood per minute did not go up. So the amount he needed six hours ago when he first came on shift is the amount that he needs now. What's different is that he has got a different heart rate. Now, his heart rate is 90 beats per minute. If his heart rate is 90 beats per minute, and, and we will assume that his heart is still generating a cardiac output of 5,400 mLs, what is his stroke volume, right? We're kind of doing a reverse calculation. So we need to take the 5,400 mLs per minute, and now we're going to divide it by his heart rate, and that will give us his stroke volume. So please do that calculation. What is his stroke volume? You're pausing, we're back. 60 mLs. Wait a minute. Six hours ago, his stroke volume was 190 mLs. Now his stroke volume is 60 mLs. Why has his stroke volume decreased? His stroke volume decreased because of the Frank Starling law of the heart. With the Frank Starling law of the heart, when he was first out of surgery, his heart was filling up with enough blood so that it would have an ejection fraction of 60%. Now, his heart is filling up with less blood, his end diastolic volume is smaller, so his ejection fraction is smaller. And those two things together are making his stroke volume go, go down. This is an important thing to remember starting now and remember it for the rest of your life. If you have any patient sitting in a waiting room anywhere, and if while they're sitting there quietly, their heart rate is slowly going up, you should be thinking of fever, you should be thinking of pain and a couple other things, but you always should be thinking of internal bleeding. This is evidence that this 30 year old man, his surgery, something's going wrong and he's bleeding into his abdomen and it needs to be evaluated, right? You can be the PA or the nurse who saves this dude's life because you figured out that his raising heart rate, even though it's not an alarming heart rate, this is not a tachycardia. It's going up when it shouldn't be going up, and it could be a sign he's bleeding internally. One more thing about Frank Starling. Frank Starling is the principal 
that is working every minute of every day to keep the output from the two ventricles synchronized. Imagine that for some reason, the right ventricle got really happy and it just really squeezed out a lot more blood in this last heartbeat than the left ventricle. That is going to make it so there's more blood in the lung. So at the next beat, the left heart, left side of the heart is gonna fill up with more venous blood. So the left ventricle will have a slightly increased preload. And so it will contract even better the next time and it catches back up. The Frank Starling Law of the Heart was actually discovered because it's the principle that keeps the two ventricles constantly synchronized in their cardiac output so you don't end up with pulmonary edema. So our first, uh, our first description of how cardiac output is regulated was with preload. That was all the Frank Starling stuff. Now let's talk about contractility. Contractility is a related concept. It actually took me a while to figure out why it was different. Here's how it's different. On an average day when you're healthy and there's nothing going on, if I were to fill up your ventricles with 150 mLs, you would probably have an ejection fraction of 60%, say. But if I gave you an injection of epinephrine and I filled up your ventricles with the same amount of blood, so the preload's the same, the end diastolic volume's the same, but I gave you an injection of epinephrine, I would have increased your contractility. So at that point, with the same number of mils inside the ventricles, instead of a 60% ejection fraction, I might get an 80% ejection fraction. That is because epinephrine is a drug that is a positive inotropic agent, or we might simply say a positive inotrope. A positive inotrope is a substance, sometimes a medication, sometimes not. It is a substance that will increase contractility. So for any degree of stretch of the ventricles, it causes more of a contraction, right? So for any degree of end diastolic volume, you would have an increase in ejection fraction when there is a positive inotrope on board. Uh, thyroid hormone is a positive inotropic agent. Epinephrine is a positive inotropic agent. Um, drugs to decrease high blood pressure are very often negative inotropic agents. We want the heart to cool out because it's putting out too much blood that's causing high blood pressure. I want you to remember this term, inotropic or inotrope. Inotropic refers to how hard the heart is beating, so it refers to ejection fraction. Chronotrope, hmm, do I have that somewhere? Let me, let me write it down, chronotrope. Chronotrope is a related concept, concept and a chronotropic agent, chronotropic agent. A chronotropic agent is an agent that, that influences heart rate. Epinephrine is a positive inotrope, makes the heart beat faster. It's also a positive chronotrope. It makes the heart beat, I think I said that wrong. Epinephrine is a positive inotrope, makes the heart beat harder. And it's also a positive chronotrope, makes the heart beat faster. There are medications that make the heart beat harder while making the heart beat more slowly. One of them called digitalis is very commonly used even now in heart failure. Okay. So the third parameter that changes cardiac output minute by minute is something called afterload. Now I had a happy daisy on preload because in general, um, the, we have a problem with uh, preload when there's not enough, right? Usually more preload's better. We have a problem with afterload when there's too much. So I put, I put a sad face on it. What is afterload? Afterload is the pressure in the main arteries, and I'm usually thinking of the aorta, but it applies to the pulmonary trunk as well. The pressure in those arteries that has to be overcome before one of those semilunar valves can open, right? So I want you to imagine this, right? Here I am, 
I am inside of the left ventricle. Here is my aortic valve and right out there, that is my aorta and the blood pressure out there is whatever it is, right? Let's imagine you've got healthy blood pressure. If you've got healthy blood pressure, let's say it's 110 over 70, right? Then when, when me, the left ventricle, decides I'm going to start um, my ejection, then the amount of pressure I need to generate here inside of the ventricle just needs to be more than whatever that is. Right now, it's 70. So as the ventricle, I'm going to contract. And when I get up to 71, then boom, the aortic valve opens and blood starts to leave and goes out into the aorta. But what if the blood pressure out there is very high? What if you've got blood pressure that's super high? Like sometimes um, people will have blood pressure that's like 180 over 120. Ooh. So when someone's got blood pressure of 180 over 120, that means when the ventricle starts to try to push and wants to move blood out, it, if it gets in here up to 71, that's not swinging open those doors. It gets up to 100, no, nope, doors are not opening. Gets up to 110, the aortic valve is still not opening. If the pressure out there is 120, these valves will not open up until the pressure in here is 121. When the pressure in here is 121, then the valves will open up, then the blood can start to leave. When there is increased afterload, that usually happens because of high blood pressure, but when there's increased afterload, the aortic valve or the pulmonary valve, it will open later in the cardiac cycle and it also closes more quickly. So that means that this ventricle, when someone's got high blood pressure, is working harder to move any blood at all. And with all that extra effort, it ends up creating a smaller stroke volume than a healthy heart does, a healthy heart does with half the effort. This is afterload is one of the reasons that high blood pressure will cause heart failure. Because when someone has got high blood pressure, there is really increased afterload. And so that person still needs a, a cardiac output of 5,400 uh, milliliters per minute, right? But it has to work twice as hard to move that 5,400 milliliters. So it is as if the person with high blood pressure is running a sprint 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, running a sprint for an hour a day, maybe that's good for your heart. It would make it stronger. But for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it's just going to cause little injuries. And there, since it's 24 hours a day, there is never any chance for the heart to heal itself, to recover from the injuries that accumulate. So uh, it ends up causing heart failure. All right, the volume of blood ejected from one ventricle in one heartbeat, what is that called? Is that called the ejection fraction? No, the ejection fraction is going to be a decimal or a percentage. It is not a volume. Is that the preload? No, the preload is equivalent to the end diastolic volume. Is that the afterload? No, the afterload is the amount of pressure in the great uh, arteries. Is it the cardiac output? No, that's not the volume of blood ejected from the ventricle in one heartbeat. Cardiac output is the amount ejected in one minute. So the right answer is the stroke volume. The pressure in the arteries that opposes the opening of semilunar valves is called what? Yeah, well, we just said this one. Should I wait? No, pause the video if you don't know and want to look it up. Otherwise, it is afterload. Okay. Great. We are going to start there on the next video.